head screws. And we're using this um, impact handy. It works some of the time. <laughs> So far, we're, we're trying to take these off as carefully as possible uh, in the hopes that we'll be able to put them back on. This is nice mahogany and this is yellow cedar. And here we have, you can see a repair. That was a double thickness. And this is the original. And then this is the, uh, the secondary transom put on out of mahogany later on. Normally the, uh, the real transom you would see the planks come all the way to the back, so when you, when you look at the stern of the boat, you see the ends of the planks and then the, the transom butting into the end of the planks. Is it going to fit? Looks pretty good. Well, it uh, looks more or less like it should. I think I still need to put some more battens in here before I can really trust it. So I've made a template of the third frame from forward. <clears throat> uh, some of them are just, the pieces just fell out when the planking came off. This one looks like it had been cut at some point. It's, uh, it's got a flat top, so I'm just trying to reestablish the shape over here. So I've got a batten on the inside and a batten on the outside, but really I need a couple more battens on the inside, I think, to really properly define the shape, <clears throat> which means I think I need to remove a little last bit of ceiling here, and there's a small bulkhead that separated the chain locker from the rest of the forecastle. so yeah, I think that's my next job, is get that bit of ceiling out, and that small bulkhead, I gotta pull some fasteners out of the inside of the frame, so that I got a nice place for the batten to lay and then I'll put a couple more battens on the inside of the boat so I've defined the inside edge of the frame. Then I will know whether or not I can believe this pattern I just made. It looks good from here, but uh, yeah, I think we need a couple more battens to really tell us. Once we're happy with the shape of the batten, then we're gonna go try to find an appropriate sized piece of, I think locust, hopefully, to cut it out of. Um, up this far forward, it's relatively straight. So hopefully we can find a piece of locust that's grown to the right shape. But I don't know if you can uh, see this thing. It's, uh, I mean, it's still curved, but it's relatively straight. This edge over here is straight of the door skin. So we line that up on the straight edge. And it looks like we need a seven and a half inch by three inch piece of locust to cut that out of. And hopefully the piece we find already has some of that shape grown into it. If we had the wood, we could possibly do the two frames aft of this one before they start getting enough curve to them that we'd have to start thinking about sawing futticks or whatnot. So yeah, I think the plan is to do sort of the first three to four frames forward and maybe the breast hook out of locust. And then same aft, we're gonna do uh, three or four sawn frames back there. And then probably the rest in laminated yellow cedar.
the job is to put some temporary stanchions here on all the length of the boat. Uh, we're gonna use them to replace the clamping shelf just behind because right now all the top of the frames are completely rotten so you cannot, you cannot push something on it, you cannot screw on this. So that's the job of all these tensions is to act like uh, top frames and therefore you can replace shelf and clamp to the end. So uh, now we're going to take up a little bit of the history of the North Star, mostly starting uh, with the original owner, Fred Carpenter, and in detail a little bit about the role that the North Star and Fred played in the resettlement of Banks Island and the issues of Canadian sovereignty that are associated with that. The place to start is by looking at this from 30,000 feet or <laughs> 300,000 feet. If you look at the, uh, the, the location of Banks Island and uh, Herschel Island in the Canadian Arctic, it's pretty clear right away that as you come in up in through the Bering Strait into the Arctic that you need to go past Banks Island if you're going further into the Arctic. If you're going through the Northwest Passage as, as Sven eventually did, second owner of North Star, uh, then you need to go past Banks Island and up and around all the archipelago of the, of the Canadian North. So Banks Island, in fact, takes a very uh, commanding position in this picture of the North. And Saks Harbor, which is the original home port of the North Star, has always been the main uh, settlement on Banks Island. It's right in the southwest corner. It's as close as you can get to, uh, to Herschel Island on the mainland, which is where the, uh, the North Star would go during the navigation season in order to take everything back from Banks Island that they, that they harvested over the winter season. During this pre-war period, this would be up, up until the time of the war, this was a very lucrative enterprise. They would trap all winter long and then take as much as North Star could carry back to Herschel Island and trade it at the Hudson's Bay trading post there for everything they needed. Very little money, mostly just uh, goods, uh, stuff they would take back for and trade back there uh, on Banks Island when they got back. During the war, this all kind of shut down, and after the war, there just was no money in it. There was no longer a decent price for a white fox. And so instead of going every year to Banks Island, these people, led by, led by Fred, he was, the, he was the leader, really, what they call the Bankslanders, they stayed. They, instead of yearly uh, getting North Star and heading out uh, across to, to Banks Island, they decided that they would just stay on the mainland and they settled in tuk 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 And uh, for a period of 12 years, they didn't go back to Banks Island. They didn't. So during this period, Banks Island was uninhabited. This big island right at the entrance to the Northwest Passage, a very strategic location for Canada. And of course, during this period, along came the Cold War and all kinds of concerns about ballistic missiles in the dew line. The uh, Americans developed and built mostly in Canada. This was all about Russian uh, intercontinental ballistic missiles, ICBMs, coming across the North Pole, shortest route from Russia, is right across the North Pole, uh, right over Canada and into all the big U.S. cities. So they wanted to have this dew line, distant early warning line, 
bill. And these were huge radar discs that were connected together by radio. So if you go to Tuck now, you can, you can see this old dew station. It's not, not in use anymore, but I mean, a huge dish. So they had the main station at Tuck, but they needed some repeater stations. And in order to do this, they needed to have a permanent settlement on Banks Island. They needed people there that could service it. And, you know, in the meantime, nobody there. There's nobody there on Banks Island at all. So the Canadian government took it upon themselves to try to talk Fred and his group using Earth Star and going back and relocating themselves back to Banks Island and in fact establishing a permanent settlement there. That was the Canadian government's solution to this problem. So the government tried very hard to get Fred, convince him to go back. And Fred could see that this was an opportunity <laughs> and he drove a hard bargain. He insisted that the Canadian government build a school there for one thing so the Inuit children didn't have to leave Banks Island to go away to school if they were actually going to establish a permanent settlement there. And he insisted that they build an airport, which they eventually did, and <laughs> uh, that they uh, have access to a CBC radio, that they weren't, uh, the only signals they could get were from US stations. So those are the three things he wanted. And the, the government ended up doing all kinds of things to convince him to go back. They ended up writing off a lot of uh, debts, loans that they had, and they set up a special fund that they could get advance money on future uh, harvest of, of the white fox. Uh, Fred was very successful in, in driving a hard bargain, and eventually they did gather up everything they had there, and put it all aboard North Star, and uh, off they went, back up to Banks Island. Fred built a house there, first permanent settlement on Banks Island, and uh, eventually, I guess, he passed away there. Uh, you know, he lived there for the rest of his life. Today, if you go there to Saks Harbor, you see that it's a thriving settlement. <laughs> There's, uh, I mean, it's the main settlement in this area. So I was surprised at how, uh, how much inhabitation there was in some place that seems so isolated. If you look at it on the map, how far north it is, oh my goodness. <laughs> some of the more recent news about this is, you know, how, how threatened this area is by sea level rise. I guess the Herschel Island, they already have an abandonment plan that it's so low that uh, it's just not going it, it, it to, be, it can't be inhabited. We're very fortunate to be working on this incredible boat that's done all this, you know, amazing stuff in the north. I mean, even as a Canadian, I think, well, no, the north, what's the north? Well, it's enormous, it's huge, and it's dangerous. I mean, it's, it's cold, it's full of ice, there's all, all kinds of problems that we don't have to deal with. So this is the job that North Star had to do, and this is the job she did for all those years. Oh, get right in there. I am making what I believe might be the first piece of wood to go back in the boat. The race is on. This is uh, frame number three, starboard side. This is a uh, black locust, also known as acacia, and it is extremely hard. What do they say? Farmers use it for fence posts because it lasts longer than the hole, I guess. It, uh, it's extremely rot resistant. It's hard, fast growing. It basically does everything white oak does, but better. We've had to cut it out with a skill saw. So we don't have a big enough band saw yet. I believe we have one is imminent. You can see the line. This is the actual frame width, I suppose but there's quite a bit of bevel on it forward as the hull comes in, so <clears throat> what you see here between this line and that will mostly get planed off this side and the reverse of it on the other side, so the thing will end up as a parallelogram in the end. So a rough cut it with the skill saw, plane it down until it's actually at the lines and then start cutting the bevels onto it. And that should be the first piece in and then we'll do the same for frames number one and two. And then the plan is, is to come back towards the break in the deck a bit more. And uh, replace a couple of frames here. Once we get back further, the majority of the frames are going to be uh, laminated yellow cedar. <clears throat> so we'll saw in locust frames for the first three and then back here we'll put in a couple of laminated yellow cedar and then one or two in the middle between that span and then we'll have some new good wood because we'll also be replacing the shear clamp and the beam shelf uh, but at least that'll give us something to bend to. 
So we will also be removing this deck sometime soon. But I think first we're gonna try to get a few frames bent in. And that's what I'm doing. I'm shaping the outside base of frame number three. It's pretty much there. We, uh, just truing up the end of the block plane. Carved most of the bevel on the concave face with this uh, compass power plane. But uh, it's a bit hard to finesse at the end, so I'm just finishing it off with my block plane. And now I'm pretty much ready to try it on the boat, I think, almost. Connected on our transom. We just uh, pulled it up and slightly out of place the other day. And uh, we were going to try to attempt to rebuild it in place, but due to a bunch of deterioration around our horn timber and just being able to have access in it, we've uh, created a, a stand where we're going to put our old transom into, copy all of our uh, angles. Uh, make patterns of our ring frame and our uprights and uh, essentially build a brand new transom. All internal framing will be uh, yellow cedar and uh, we'll do uh, some sort of tropical hardwood on the outside if we don't end up using the old mahogany North Star uh, transom. So yeah, we're just uh, undoing it here and then we're gonna uh, work this chain fall and bring it up onto uh, the scaffold here. And then I'm gonna be able to get at the horn timber and be able to make any uh, repairs and new wood that we need to install there. <laughs> set it down on those points just because we don't want to lose them. Every 
time I, I throw, my feet go under from underneath me. Oh.